I want to show you this clip. This is from Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, so he's a, a professor at Columbia University, and he was at a um, he was speaking at a forum. And just just watch it, and then we'll discuss. Okay. The most violent country in the world in the 19th century, by far, was perhaps the most democratic or second most democratic, and that was Britain. You can be democratic at home and ruthlessly imperial abroad. The most violent country in the world since 1950 has been the United States. It's Jeff, been by let's, far involved Jeffrey, in more, stop wait, now. In more let's, wars. Let's, let's, Jeffrey, I'm, I I'm, Jeffrey, I'm your moderator, and it's enough. Okay, I'm done. Wow. Jeffrey, I'm your mother and you need to go to your room. Speaking to him like he's a fucking child. Do you see how we cut him off? Like soon you start speaking the truth. Oh, oh, well, we have a connection problem. Bye. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, 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 no, your time's up. Sorry. You, you can't say that. It's an infamous free speech in the West. So he's right. He's, he's absolutely right. And when, when he's referring to Britain in the 19th century, I mean, you know, this is... I, I'm, I'm assuming he's referring to things like Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, uh, and, and so on, right? You know, you had certain reforms in the UK. And again, the reasons they were, they, they came into place are not always in favor of the public. But basically, you know, habeas corpus, you have the body. So, you know, things that you could be let out on bail, that you had certain rights. Because the UK doesn't have a constitution, but it has a stack of documents, right? Um, like the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and so on. So... And so the parliament in the UK and the, the judiciary at that time were considered quite modern. But, and again, it doesn't mean that the UK was necessarily democratic just because of that. I would argue it was not, and it, it still is not. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. But Jeffrey Sachs is completely right, because you can be a democracy at home or claim to be a democracy and still be authoritarian and imperialist abroad. And that was the case with Britain, and it's now the case with the UK. Um, sorry, with the US and the UK at the helm. So people want to want to. They have like a very simplistic view of things. They think that democracy is something inherent to Western countries, right? You, you if you ask people, is France a democracy? They'd say, yeah, it is. You know, and and uh, you have um, liberté, égalité, fraternité. So uh, uh, liberty, equality and uh, uh, fraternity or brotherhood um and the belgians as well the netherlands germany you know people would look at that and say yeah those are democracies but the thing is you look at their behavior outside it's not it's certainly nothing reflective of democracy it's it's subjugation right when you go to another country and you you steal people's resources and and you teach them we're well, not teach them you enforce your culture on them and erase their culture and you move them around and uproot them and, you know, kill them and treat them like they're inferior. That's not democratic at all, is it? It's, it's exploitation. It's, it's uh, colonialism. And all of these countries that I just mentioned, right? <laughs> Belgium, Netherlands, Britain, France, Germany, uh, Spain, Portugal, they're imperialists, right? For, for, they, they went all over the place massacring people in the Congo, you know, <laughs> in India, you name it. In Latin America, they, they conquered... Uh, uh, several continents and massacred the people there and stole their resources while at the same time at home pretending to be you know in an era of enlightenment and being advanced and so on and the problem is that to this day that dynamic is still correct it's still true because um you 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 had decolonization which maybe you could say started in 1945 but it it didn't finish it certainly didn't finish because you know right now there are u.s troops stealing oil from syria they're occupying uh, west of the Euphrates, uh, sorry, east of the Euphrates. Um, it's about roughly one third of Syria. It's the most important part of Syria. It has all the oil and all the the crops are grown there. The breadbasket region. So that that's colonialism, right? That you're plundering and occupying a country. I don't see how it isn't. Um, you know, the French they still exert influence over African countries, which they uh, uh, have for for centuries, right? Either. Uh, with French, you know, they tried to say it's cultural influence. Yeah, well, usually when you had French cultural influence, it was at the detriment of the that country's culture, right? So um, in Syria, if you spoke Arabic, you know, the, they they slap you for for speaking Arabic in school, 
in Syria. They want you know you have to speak French. So you know they 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 still maintain French culture in Africa. They control the money, the the monetary policy of fourteen African countries. Um, they are taking the resources from those countries and using them in France. Earlier with Danny, I brought up this example that in Niger, uh, Niger, the French are extracting uranium, which they use in France to power their homes. 70% of electricity in France comes from nuclear. And, and how can they do that without this uranium from Niger? They can't. And do you think people in Niger are benefiting from that exchange? No. They don't, have, they don't even have regular electricity, never, like a power grid, never mind a nuclear one. How is that fair? How is that not exploitation? It is. It, it, it is exploitation. They give them shitty deals they, uh, and, and enforce those deals upon them. And, you know, they, they also like to portray it as aid. It's not aid. You're not helping anyone except your own pockets. So you still have a neo-colonial relationship. And this is important to remember because even if you want to live in la-la land and believe that Western European countries are democratic, well, their foreign policy certainly isn't. And I would go back to what I was saying before, which is that in the UK, um, it's not a democracy. Like we, we just had a new prime minister put in power who was not elected by the British people or even his own fucking party. Usually, in a, the, the leadership contest, this farce, did not even take place because everyone dropped out. He was just handed the job. And then the, the new king, like we have a king. Who is this guy? I, what, like, who is this guy? I, I don't understand where these people come from and they're like the leaders. For what? What do they have in common with, with regular people? They have nothing in common. Apparently, that's how it is. We have unelected king, unelected prime minister. And on top of that, you know, a, a, a hallmark of a democracy is what? It's a free press, right? And um, again, I just bring up Assange. Like, there's just no free press in the UK because they hold, uh, they're holding him in a prison, in, a, in, in Belmarsh prison. And the British judge, uh, you know, um, I, I saw her in court read out her ruling and she basically justified the charges against him. You know, because she blocked the extradition. She said, okay, you're too unhealthy. You're not healthy enough to be extradited because you'll commit suicide, which is true. That's a concern. But when it comes to the charges, like, oh, you're, you're a spy. You're a computer hacker. She agreed. She agreed with that shit. And she found equivalence under the Official Secrets Act, right? So in, in the U.S., there's Espionage Act. And, and you could say the equivalent, the rough equivalent in the U.K. is the OSA Official Secrets Act. And she basically justified it. She said, yeah, all these charges from the Department of Justice against you make sense. Because in Britain, this would also be illegal. And that's a, that's a prerequisite for extraditing someone, right? If country B wants to extradite someone from country A, the crime they're accused of must be a crime in both countries, right? It makes sense. And so that's what she did. She basically justified, said, yeah, what you did would be a crime in the UK as well. So that's why I'm sending you there. Uh, well, she said, I would have sent you there if you were healthy enough, right? And the problem is this sets a legal precedent. So in the future, you have other judges looking at this and saying, yeah, well, you know, in, this, in the Assange case, this kind of national security journalism was viewed as, you know, a hostile act. It was viewed as espionage. So I'll, I'll, I'll set you along your way to some max, uh, super max prison. You see how dangerous this is? And that's not democratic. That's not democratic by, by a long shot. You know, and it's just one case. But I, I give this example because... Uh, if, if I can say so, it's my field of expertise and I've covered the case in the court and, and, and I, I, I know a lot about it. And so every day or every session uh, in court uh, was, you know, it, it was just like a, it wasn't uh, something you would see in a so-called democracy. It was, it was the opposite of that. It was um, the state locking up a journalist and, uh, who was accused of espionage. Like that's, that's textbook authoritarianism. Right? What do you do when you want to lock a dissident up or a journalist up or a political opponent? You say they're a spy. You say they're working against the state and you put them in prison. And that's, that's what I saw uh, uh, firsthand. So I'm, I'm reporting it to you and I'm telling you what's going on. And uh, there's nothing democratic about that.